Justin, thank you for taking time to talk today. Uh, we're going to dive into supply chains, really look at the ideas of what is going on and is there anything we can be looking for in the future. From a high level, what are the risks that people overlook in supply chains? Yeah, there's a, a lot of risk. And it's been a very interesting last couple of years with what the market's seen. I mean, we still have the you know, pandemic and post-pandemic recovery not too far in a rearview mirror. And that was challenging for you know, the economy in general and, and a lot of people within our industry. Um, <clears throat> after that, we've had issues with, you know, port strikes. We've had port closures. We've had freight issues. We've had just a, a large unalignment between kind of that supply and demand. It's, it's manifested itself differently uh, throughout the market over the last couple of years. And, and we expect that to continue that, that challenge with, with building out a comprehensive and risk averse supply chain. So, I mean, the 301 tariffs that we're still working through right now that were announced earlier in the year, we've got potential more tariffs coming in next year. Um, there's a lot we're tracking and there's a lot that we're uh, being proactive to try and get ahead of and, and really helping our our customers and working with our suppliers, building that partnership and relationship to make sure that we're tackling these challenges together. So you mentioned a few things in there. How many, maybe I should just come at it this way. How often do you surprise people with the fact that Fastenal has supply chain experts? We're a supply chain driven company, right? We're not just a regular industrial distributor. We're not there dropping that box of bolts off at a customer dock. It's really about that supply chain integrity and making sure, I mean, first and foremost, that, that Fastenal is able to deliver supply chain continuity, right? That part is dependably going to be delivered, you know, at that point of use, that point of consumption regardless of what might happen, you know, upstream within the supply chain, whether it's a strike or a ship that catches on fire or, you know, whatever political reality that we have to try and navigate through. Um, it's really about building that team of subject matter experts that can drive success within that supply chain. And, and Fastenal has been really good at investing in those teams at wherever they need to be, right? So we've got, you know, well over hundred people in our Asia origin offices that are able to go on site at the factories and make sure that you know, we're solving any engineering problems. We're able to do pre-ship inspections. We're doing our, you know, vendor approval audits and, and compliance audits to make sure that we're working with quality partners and helping support them as, as requirements and regulations change. It's kind of that, that investment into relationships versus, you know, more of a transactional approach. And that's been very successful to us and to our business. And then throughout the, the movement of those goods, building into trade compliance teams, logistics teams, you know, planning and forecasting teams to make sure that we're able to get ahead of, you know, those demand spikes so that we can have that inventory on hand and, you know, able to weather any storms that may come from delayed arrival of cargo. Well, we, we sit deep within our distribution center. So, you know, we've got that safety stock built in and just aligning with our customers to make sure that, you know, our sales teams are relaying what their demand forecast looks so we can align that supply and demand. So it really comes across a lot of different teams with a lot of really cool talent that we see. Um, and then just empowering them to make decisions, own their business, and then collaborate on, on processes. So we've got visibility across all those teams. Do you think of yourself as a supply chain expert? Uh, depends on the day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's been exciting. And it's really cool to see, you know, my own journey through Fastenal has come across a, a, you know, multiple different departments starting off in sales. So understanding that piece of the business and then really finding my, my passion on the operations and supply chain side. But um, yeah, there's a lot of like-minded folks that are that are here. We collaborate with and make sure that you know we're hearing from the different subject matter experts to really guide our strategy and, and execution, depending on whatever that that risk might be to our supply chain. So let's go there. Uh, supply chain risk prediction: Is it possible? If so, does it only work at scale? Depends. It depends on what happens. Right? There's always that risk anticipation, right? So Fastenal is is very invested in trying to do that risk mitigation piece and understanding what types of risks do we face? What is the likelihood of those risks? What's the speed that those risks may manifest, right? If it's a, a port strike can happen fairly suddenly, you know, a natural disaster can happen instantaneously versus a regulatory rollout. There's some exceptions, but typically has more of a longer timeline. And so understanding like how, what's the speed of onset for that potential risk? And then what's the impact of the business, right? There might be risks that are likely to happen quickly, but they have a small impact. It's going to be treated differently than something that might have a longer lead time, but it's going to be you know, potentially massively impactful for your business. And really ranking those risks and, and putting that prioritization or, or anticipation into those based on you know, how quick and, and how impactful that's going to be. 
every company's got limited resources. So it's about deploying those resources strategically to making sure that you're targeting what really matters. And, you know, I don't say ignoring the rest of it, but um, not over-focusing on the things that you know aren't going to make that big of an impact at the end of the day. So that's a, a dynamic process. So, you know, you're starting off the year and you've got your risk assessment, you have everything mapped. You have to dust that off. You can't just let it sit. It needs to be a living document because things can change. And we've seen them literally on a daily basis as, as things evolve. And um, at a macro level, that makes sense. And then down to that, you know, item specific level, I think both of those have merit. And it's looking at what are your contingency planning. So if you've got a part that's a mission critical item, can you dual source that? Can you pull that from not only multiple factories, but multiple countries? So that, you know, if you've got exposure in country A, you've also got supply in country B. And, and finding those source of supply that makes sense within your, your risk environment and your strategic goals. What does your customer need for their supply chain and where does that need to be delivered to? So all that changes. And, and I think that's where some companies where we've seen issues in the past where, where there's a plan. It's a great plan, but it doesn't adapt and it needs to be adaptable and needs to be up to date. I like that. You you mentioned uh, country A and country B. So you're having more than one source. How important is it for country A and country B to be geographically separated? Or is that not an issue at all? Depends on what risk you're trying to mitigate. If you uh, see things like freight congestion, report strikes, or natural disasters, that geographic concentration, you might hit a lot of your supply base with a single event versus separating those out. You tend to have a bit more flexibility. Um, okay. Other solutions beyond just that geographic piece, you might look at alternative items, right? So you've got a substitute for item A and item B, and that helps work and maybe not, not, not quite as ideal, but it keeps things running, right? Looking at building out safety stocks, so you can allow more flexibility in, in you know, delivery times or those type of things. So there's multiple solutions and, and they, they don't stand alone. They all work in concert with each other. All these moving items that kind of work together that you've got a specific event that might impact a certain item, a certain region, a certain industry, um, and what have you. And some of those things that in other situations might have been your challenge now become your solution. So we've kind of been talking about things in a present state, getting ahead of things, that kind of a mindset. Uh, people aren't going to be able to see this, but I actually requested this meeting, this invitation to record was called Justin's Magic Crystal uh, Ball. Like, how are you going to look into the future? So what do you see on the horizon? Uh, any current areas of focus? There's probably better forecasters than myself out there, but I, I think it's about staying engaged with the market, you know, building relationships with third parties, with, you know, your supply chain partners, whether that's customers, suppliers, you know, legal subject matter experts, and just staying attuned to, you know, the market of, what to what to anticipate and then gauging what that perceived risk, right? There's there's a lot of information about what 2025 may bring on a lot of fronts. And I think no matter what happens, it's going to be a very interesting year and, and companies are going to have to respond in ways that may not be apparent to us now. It's about building out that that flexibility to be able to adapt and respond quickly, have robust systems that are, are flexible to support the business needs. And then, you know, Fastenal's approach is very much empower the decision makers within the organization to be able to take that quick action and not get locked into, well, this is how we've always done it, when that solution doesn't necessarily fit that new paradigm, right? So that new reality that we face as the environment or the market change, right? So we've got to be adaptable. You know, at the end of the day, it's, again, supply chain continuity, dependability, and, you know, quality of product that we can deliver regardless of what happens. So I, I'm... I'm Hesitant to try and say in 2025, we're going to see this, this, and this, because I look yep. back and think of what I had anticipated the start of every year. And there's some things we absolutely got right. And there's some things we didn't anticipate at all, right? And had to adapt quickly. But the way that we structure our business and the way that we have these subject matter experts that can feed that insight, we're able to respond quick and get ahead of it as, as you can, right? And if it's a last minute regulation change, there might not be much advanced warning, but we're able to pivot quick. Yeah. So I think if I've asked you five or six questions so far, all but one have been, you've been able to answer them with, it depends. And I'm sorry for that. Thank you. For <laughs> the uh, this next one I feel like is much more uh, obvious, but I'll ask it anyways, because it's the, the theme of the day. Uh, is AI going to play a role in the future? 
Is it already? It is already. And I think AI is a curious one. We spent, you know, fascinating even within our own department looking at the trade and logistics side, quite a bit of energy looking at, right, how does that help support our business, right? It's, it's a buzzword in a lot of senses. There's some really cool and innovative use cases. There's some great things our IT department is already starting to deploy to, to great success. And there's a lot of excitement around that. But it, it's still a new technology. It's still something that a lot of companies are coming out with solutions that are you know, leading with AI will do all these things for you. But it, it's more difficult to parse through those to see which ones actually have value for their business because they solve a fundamental problem in a way that, that you know, helps out versus it just sounds cool when you try and get the marketing team engaged with it, right? And there are use cases. I think there's some that are maybe still in their infancy. And so we've seen good progress with where that, you know, automation within, you know, data collection and management and all that. It's really understanding how those use cases actually get applied and understanding the, the value that you actually see versus anticipate with those early conversations. I'm excited for what it can bring. It, it really is a force multiplier, I think, with some of our teams of just, gathering insight from data and, and companies like Fastenal, even within logistics and trade and you know supply chain, there's a amazing amount of data that we collect that can be difficult to go through, right? To analyze and to parse through and find relationships there that can lead to further insights that might either help optimize the business, provide more solutions for customers, or you know bring clarity to certain risk events even. So that part I'm excited about. What I don't know yet is what does that look like a year from now, five years from now, and which of the areas that are most open to being you know, transform, transformed by AI innovation and which ones we're still going to do the same thing now that we were, you know, or things that we'll still be doing in the future that we're doing now that are more, I don't say resistant to that change, but harder to crack. Yeah. I, I feel like in so many ways, five years from now will be different in a couple of monumental ways because of AI. But we, just like you're saying, have no way of knowing exactly which ways. So, right. Okay. Yeah. And just, just looking back in the last five years, I mean, a lot of our processes have gone through wholesale changes as we just rethink how we approach. And this based on experience, it's based on continuing to build out more subject matter experts and, you know, better processes, more automation and, you know, more redundancy within our systems. We've come a tremendously long way and that momentum hasn't ceased. So we'll continue to see that and continue to you know, break out of our teams a silo and collaborate across the organization. I think that's something Fastenal does really well, but that's only gotten better through the pandemic and post-pandemic recovery. We were good. Now we're at the point where we're great and we're still continuing to try and push that best in class synergy across departments. And really all that comes down to you know, benefit for our customers because we're that you know, supply chain machine that's able to anticipate, deliver, and you know, bring value to their overall supply chain. I have taken more than enough of your time, but is there anything else you wanted to touch on? No, I say for everyone else that's out there in logistics or purchasing supply chain planning, it's an interesting environment. It's an exciting time. It can be stressful, but yeah, we're excited for what comes in 2025 and we're rolling up our sleeves and getting ready to, to jump in and continue to, to optimize the solution and yeah, drive value. Thanks for talking, sir. Yep, it's been a pleasure. Thank you much. 